Okay, so welcome back. And it's the last session of the uh, afternoon and of the second day. And it's my big pleasure to introduce uh, Irene Benini. And I would like to say, some, I, I, I haven't said anything about any of the speakers, but I'd like to say something about Irene. She, uh, she's a PhD student in, in uh, well, I, I'd say history. Uh, it's history of logic, but it doesn't make any sense to anyone. So it's his, let's say it's history. It's way back history. And she's been enduring a set of talks which are way beyond the comfort zone of one doing a PhD in the area. So I'd like to stress this. And not only she's been here listening to us, she's, always, she's also going to tell us something which I think is going to be extremely interesting on reasoning, deliberating, choosing in Aristotelian ethics. So thanks very much, Yvonne. Please. So I want to, to thank the organizers who, for giving me this opportunity. I hope this will be useful also for you. And uh, my talk will be an historical perspective on theory of decision. And in particular, I will try to give a very introductive presentation about the Aristotle's theory of decision, uh, which many interpreters think is the very first philosophical theory of decision. But before coming to Aristotle, I would like to recall some general features of other ancient uh, theory of uh, human actions, uh, which uh, some features are also shared by Aristotle. Here I chose two features which uh, will be uh, used uh, after. And uh, I wanted to stress the fact that uh, ancient philosophers, many ancient philosophers, dedicated a lot of space to the investigations of uh, uh, the reasons, the conditions and the motivations for, of uh, human actions. And uh, uh, first of all, they thought uh, um, that human beings are responsible of at least the sum of their actions. Uh, so there are some actions which are up to the agent, and the agent is free uh, to do uh, those actions. This is not at all a trivial condition, because uh, uh, ancient philosophy, in ancient philosophy, determinism is a very strong uh, philosophical position. So, um, but the Socrates, Plato, and also Aristotle stress this fact that uh, uh, there are actions which are voluntary actions. And this is also a necessary presupposition in order to have uh, an ethical theory. Because ethics is the theory of good and bad actions, but this doesn't make uh, much sense uh, if we don't think that human beings have the responsibility of their actions. And that's why uh, the theory of human actions is uh, uh, presented by ancient philosophers together with uh, their ethical theories. And also for the Aristotelian theory, we, we, found, uh, we find this theory in the Nicomachean ethics. Um, for an action, in order to be a, a voluntary action, ancient philosophers thought that this action must be rationally motivated, which means that uh, when an agent uh, is uh, acting freely, there has to be some kind of uh, reasoning which precedes the action itself. So they thought that, for example, actions which are motivated by some irrational uh, causes, like, for example, desires, or, for example, uh, impulses or appetites. These are not voluntary actions because the agent acting is somehow forced or compelled to do this action by his desire. Aristotle is not, uh, is not uh, ag agreeing with this uh, position, and uh, I will show why. But Socrates, quite, uh, mm, yeah, really clearly, clearly says that uh, it's this kind of reasoning is not just a necessary condition for an action to be a voluntary action, but he thinks that uh, um, some kind of uh, theoretical deductive reasoning is also a sufficient condition to motivate an action. What does this mean? 
Socrates, Socrates thinks that if someone with his uh, theoretical reasoning arrives to know what is good to do in a certain moment, then he will do it. So if some agent know what is good to do, then he will do this thing. And if someone doesn't do what is good to do in a certain situation, it be is because he is ignorant of uh, what is good to do. And that's why uh, Socrates' theory, and in some respects also Plato's theories, was charged of intellectualism, because they thought that knowledge was a sufficient condition to motivate human actions. Okay, so someone who was really discontent with this uh, theory was Aristotle, and simply because uh, he thinks that it doesn't represent at all the reality of facts because uh, we, have, we could have plenty of examples of people perfectly knowing what is good to do in a certain situation, but still acting differently. So he thinks that knowledge and theoretical reasoning are not enough to motivate uh, an action. And um, first of all, a theory of action must take into account not just the rational part of human beings, but also the irrational constituents of human beings, uh, like, for example, desires and wants. And second, Aristotle thinks that if we want to consider a theory of actions, we don't have just to take into account uh, actions themselves, but we also have to consider human decisions. And this word decisions, in Greek, pro aeresis, uh, has this first uh, uh, philosophical use precisely with Aristotle. Uh, for example, Karen Nielsen um, highlighted the fact that uh, there is no use of this uh, word before Aristotle. But Aristotle himself uh, didn't uh, coin the word, and he probably borrowed this word, the decision, pro aeresis, from the legal context. Uh, for example, um, we have uh, evidence of the use of this word in the uh, forensic speeches of the Aristotle's contemporary Demosthenes. And in this context, uh, the word decision was used when, for example, during a trial, a jury had to return a verdict not just taking into account uh, the accused person's actions, but also the accused uh, person's intentions, and uh, uh, they had to take into account uh, if the accused decided to act in a certain way, and for what goal he, uh, so to, for the sake of what goal, what end, uh, he decided to act this way. So, in a certain sense, in this uh, legal, uh, legal context, they thought that decisions were manifestations in some sense, uh, of uh, uh, the agent intentions, much more than actions are. And Aristotle uses decision the very same way. So he thinks that decisions are something that precede actions, that manifest the agent intentions, and that are done for the sake of something else. In order to explain uh, what is the meaning of the word decision in Aristotelian theory, I referred back to the etymology of uh, the Greek word. But don't be scared because this is the only Greek word uh, I used uh, in this talk. So um, I also took this uh, distinction again from uh, Karen Nielsen's um, uh, paper on Aristotelian theory of decision. So uh, as you can see, the, w the, the Greek word for decision is pro aeresis, and is composed by two different parts. Iresis, which uh, uh, in Greek means a choice, and this prefix pro, which could have three possible meanings. A temporal meaning, a preferential meaning, and a teleological meaning. Um, if we take a pro to uh, mean something, so in the first temporal meaning, we have that decision, pro iresis, is what is chosen before something else. So, what is chosen in advance. So choice is something that comes before decision. In the second sense, uh, pro is something that is chosen instead of something else. Uh, 
so something that is preferred to some other avail available alternatives. Uh, in the last meaning, the teleological meaning, pro iresis is something that is chosen pro something else. So as I said before, for the sake of something else, in the light of some goal we want to attain. And uh, these three meanings are also the three main constituents of the Aristotelian theory of decision. So now I will, uh, I will um, present them one by one. Uh, so let's start from the first one. As I said, uh, a decision is something that comes after a choice. So decision is what is chosen in advance. We note uh, that uh, for Aristotle, decision and choice do not mean the same thing. Because uh, uh, I think that the most important distinction between the, the two con concepts, as Aristotle used them, is that the choice is a temporal process. So a time-taking process, which is also quite complex in Aristotelian theory. And the end of this, uh, uh, pro uh, of this process so the, uh, is the momentary act of decision. So while decision is something momentary, uh, choice is something that, uh, uh, that is temporal. And uh, uh, Aristotle, when he speaks about choice, um, a synonymous of choice for Aristotle is deliberation. So what does this uh, process of choosing consist in? Uh, I say that Aristotle was really discontent, discontent with the Socratic theory that uh, the knowledge of what is good is uh, a good guide for uh, human actions. Because Aristotle thinks that uh, in real life, we never have to choose between a good action and a bad actions. Because all the actions we have to choose among have both the good and bad consequences. So how could the mere knowledge of what is good help us in doing the choice? And Aristotle does this example. There is a storm, we are on a ship, and uh, the goods we are carrying with our ships are so heavy that are preventing us to take the control of the ship. So we have to decide if we should uh, throw overboard uh, our goods and then saving our shipmates and the ship and ourselves, uh, or try to save the goods uh, and uh, have the risk of uh, losing the ship. So Aristotle seems to think that uh, the choice between saving the shipmates and sh saving the goods is a hard choice uh, to take. Um, but uh, the point is that uh, uh, both, the, of these, uh, both uh, mm, actions have uh, mm, bad consequences. Uh, there is not a merely good action. And so Aristotle thinks that here the theoretical knowledge of what is good is not of much help because Actually, in choice, we don't have to decide what is good to do, but we have to decide what is best to do. Yes? So is there an example in Socrates of uh, something that is good? Uh, just to understand, uh, as opposed to this. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, okay, so it's... <laughs> It's not really simple to, to answer this question uh, because uh, in the Socratic and Platonic uh, uh, theories, uh, actually, the good is a, ver is a really abstract concept. But we could say, I think Rossella and I had it on this, that uh, for Socrates and Plato, um, the good somehow con coincides with, uh, <laughs> okay, with um, with knowledge. In what sense? Uh, they seem to think that uh, the intrinsic nature of human beings is their rationality. So uh, human beings are rational beings, and to uh, arrive to the best for any kind of being is to accomplish their own nature. But what is the nature of human beings? Is their rationality. So Socrates identifies uh, the good with, uh, we can say, knowledge. But when we arrive to what kind of knowledge are we talking about, that there is really different.
Ça. Just a, a decision to read. If, if I look at this, I say, okay, there is a trade-off, no? Yeah. Uh, in some states is good, in some states. So the opposite case is, is uh, something that is in this situation. In all situation is good, no? It, it can happen. You have a weakly dominant, as we say. Would that a possible reading uh, of uh, that they sort of uh, originally uh, overlook trade-offs, uh, and then Aristotle said there are trade-offs out there. Life is not as simple as. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I should think about it. But I think that maybe uh, when we will arrive to understand what is good for Aristotle, I think I will also say th th something on this. Because we will see the distinction between the two different views, the Socratic one and the Aristotelian one. But after, if you're not satisfied, uh, you can ask again uh, the same question. Okay, so uh, where, where was I? Uh, okay, so uh, I say that in the process of choosing for Aristotle, we need to uh, know what is best to do. And so we don't really need uh, a kind of theoretical knowledge of what is good, an abstract, uh, a general principle of good, which uh, Socrates thought uh, it was the real good, but we have to know what is best. And this is a task of what Aristotle calls our practical rationality. So, uh, while Socrates and Plato thought that ethical theories were uh, concerning uh, general abstract principles, so for example, uh, there could be a system of moral rules or a system of laws telling us what is good to do in a certain situation. This is not true for Aristotle, because for Aristotle uh, to know what is good to do, what is best to do, uh, is just a task of the individual being, because it really depends on the specific situation we are in. So there are not general principles of behavior, for example. And uh, uh, in this specific particular situation, our practical rationality, first of all, must to perceive the situation and to see which are the available options at that moment. And then uh, the practical rationality has to calculate which are all the pros and cons of each possible action, so all the costs and benefits of each possible action, in respect to an end that we want to satisfy, that for Aristotle, differently from Socrates, could also be a desire. So could also be an irrational, uh, irrational uh, part of the human being. And so the practical rationality in respect to this end uh, or this desire that we want to satisfy has to identify which are the right suitable means to reach that particular end. And in the end of this process of calculation, Re uh, practical rationality ends up uh, with a decision, finally. So I talked as, uh, uh, of practical rationality as a calculation. This is not anachronistic to be at attributed to Aristotle, because Aristotle really thinks that what uh, practical reasoning does is to calculate. I took here two quotations from the Nicomachean Ethics, in which Aristotle says that to deliberate, so to reason, and to calculate are the same thing. Okay, just to, to show you uh, what I'm talking about when I talk about uh, practical rationality or theoretical rationality, uh, Aristotle had this uh, uh, conception of the human soul uh, as divided in different parts. An irrational part, like the vegetative part and appetitive part, which concerns uh, all the uh, human activities, for example, motions, sensations, desires, uh, which uh, human beings also share with other kind of beings, for example, plants and animals. And then there are two different kinds of rationality. A theoretical scientific rationality, which works with uh, logic principles, uh, is a kind of, a, a kind of, of reasoning, uh, um, a deductive kind of reasoning, trying to grasp uh, 
the abstract principle and general laws, while the uh, practical rationality works in the very concrete context of action, so with the particular and contingent element, not with abstract theories. And uh, as you can see from the scheme, practical rationality is for Aristotle much close, closer than theoretical rationality to the irrational part of the human being. That's why it can take into account also human desires and not just uh, rational constituents. So I think, how much time do I have? Okay, I go... Ah, okay. Now I go really fast on this because uh, I already mentioned something. Um, this is the second meaning of the word pro iresis, uh, the preferential meaning. I already uh, said that when, uh, for Aristotle, when we make a decision, uh, in order to be a real decision, there has have to be other alternative options that we can choose. So. Uh, for Aristotle, if I do an action, and uh, it's my intention to do that action, but I, I, I can't do anything else than that action, it's not a decision. So in order to be a decision, there has to be at least two different alternatives. But I, I skip to the third meaning, so the uh, teleological meaning. Uh, I say that for Aristotle, the task of practical rationality is to uh, choose which are the suitable means to attain a particular end. But now we come to uh, the, the question of uh, which are the ends that uh, uh, human beings want to attain uh, with their actions. And Aristotle seems to think that there is just one singular end, ultimate end, to which uh, all human actions are directed, and it's what, uh, what, uh, what his, he calls eudaimonia, and we can translate as happiness, flourishing, or Aristotle also speaks of living well, being well. And so in the beginning of the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle says that every voluntary action, as we said before, is made on the basis of a decision, and that every decision is a choice which is made for the sake of happiness. So we, here we have the teleological meaning. So every decision is a choice made for the sake, for the, to accomplish this goal. Uh, happiness for Aristotle is not a univocal meaning because he tries to specify which are the constituents of happiness, uh, which can consist in uh, external goods, for example, political power, money, or goods of the body, for example, to be, beauty, to be beautiful will enrich our happiness. And uh, goods of the soul, for example, knowledge, virtue, culture, and friendship. But now I just wanted to end giving you a hint of what could be a, a problem that interpreters, interpreters have to, to solve. Uh, so what is the work of uh, historians of uh, philosophy? And the problem is this one. Does Aristotle leave room in his theory of decision also for decisions of goals or just for decisions of means? So is the goal of any human action already fixed? And we, our task, the task of our rationality is just to find the right ways to attain that goal? Or we can even say that we can decide what are the ends of our actions. And this is a big problem for interpreters, and many uh, opinions have been done um, on this. And if we take the second position, so the idea that uh, we don't really choose to be happy, as Aristotle says, but we want or desire to be happy, um, then the consequence of this position would be that our rationality has just an, an instrumental role. So, um, for example, Daniela Kam Kamak, um, says that Aristotle and Hume, on this point, say the same thing. 
that uh, reason is just something that uh, serves us, that uh, we need uh, to attain some goals that are ultimately irrational. Uh, here I just wanted to, to point out a possible solution to this uh, problem. The fact that uh, this is, it's true that Aristotle says that happiness uh, is not something that we choose or that we decide to be, but it's something that we want to be. But it's also true that uh, Aristotle uh, uh, treats happiness as just a formal quite empty end. And uh, we, in order to uh, give content to this end, we have to specify it in the sense that we have to tell what does mean for us to live a happy life. So in which consists happiness. And so if we take uh, happiness just to be a formal end and not a really consistent end in Aristotelian theory, we could say that the task of our reason is not just instrumental task because reason has a double role in this uh, solution. The first one is to give content to this end, so to specify, to find what does it mean for, ha for us uh, uh, to, to live a happy life. And the second one is the one we talked before, so to seek which are the suitable means to attain that kind of life that we uh, consider happy. And uh, here I stop. <laughs> Thanks very much, Irene. Are there questions? Yeah, sure. Um, I've got a question about religion, actually. So, uh, yeah, um, I was wondering if it enters the picture in Aristotle's mind. Um, and if it enters the picture, is that, uh, I mean, is it in the goals or only in the goals, let's say, uh, which are fixed by somebody else, maybe, or something else? I don't know. Well, if uh, I understand your question, um, Aristotle could agree with the fact that, uh, for example, um, we have some particular ends which are fixed. So, for example, uh, to, I don't know, uh, behave some way in order to attain some particular goal. But the fact, if you mean religion also as something that gives you some rules of behavior, as I just uh, said before, Aristotle would be really discontent with this. Because he thinks that the, is the individual being who really has the ultimate word, the last word in saying what is good to do. Uh, what is good to do in a certain situation can't be previously given by someone else or by something else. So, gener what? Some, no. That, uh, uh, this is a consequence of uh, Aristotle, uh, uh, Aristotle theory because he doesn't take into account religion. But, for example, uh, in respect to a system of laws, uh, Aristotle would think that, uh, yes, uh, people should follow the laws, but there are some situations in which an individual can uh, do not respect the law, because the law is what is saying that it's good to do something that in that particular situation is not good to do. And this is a huge difference from uh, Socrates, for example. Think that Socrates in Crito says that his condemnation to death wasn't a, a good choice by the law. But still, he says that he has to respect the laws. Because the good is what is specified, for example, by the laws of the city. Okay. You know, there is this caricature that economists are more uh, the, the decisions, uh, are individual decisions, sociologists have more norms-based decisions, and the norms are very important. So is the, then the difference between uh, Aristotle and Socrates sort of that between norms uh, and free will? Yeah, and uh, mainly between Aristotle and Plato, because Plato was a theorist of the fact that, for example, society or some uh, go, um, yeah, governor could 
say, specify what is good to do for any individuals, for example, and giving the rules for the city, for the society. And I think that in Aristotle there's, there's the uh, desire of directly uh, going against this uh, platonic view. Uh, thanks very much. Could you say something about failure to promote one's goals? Uh, could you say something about uh, failure to promote one's goals or desires, so irrationality, weakness of the will? I mean, it, it okay, okay, I see what you mean. Uh, okay, I think that uh, Aristotle, in respect to Socrat Socrates, for example, had quite a sophisticated uh, theory of decision, but I think that uh, he is quite unsatisfactory in saying why when we did, for example, the good decision, then the good action doesn't follow. So, it is not given that if I do the good, a good decision, for example, so I choose what is the best, and so my rationality works really well, and I, I really individ, uh, specified what is the best to do, then I don't do it. And Aristotle here doesn't really give a good solution, I think, because somehow he refers back to the Socratic view, and he, because he says that uh, if I took the good uh, decision, but uh, I don't uh, mm, do the good action, is because I am uh, not ignorant of what is good to do, because I, do the, I did the, the good decision, but I have a momentary blindness which prevents me to do the good thing. So for example, if I know, I perfectly know that I don't have to eat chocolate because uh, uh, yeah, I am on a diet, and I do the good decision and I say, no, I won't uh, uh, eat that chocolate, but then I see it and I get like m blind for a moment and then I eat it. And so somehow he still uh, gives a solution referring back to a momentary ignorance of what is good to do in that moment. So weakness of will, akrasia in uh, Greek, uh, is referred still back to uh, some kind of ignorance. But I think that this is not a good, uh, good solution. Do you have a question? Yeah. Well, I, I'll make it quick. So, so there does seem to be some tension between the idea that happiness is a purely formal notion and this sort of shopping list that we saw. I mean, so if he really was providing even a, a large list of characteristics, it's, it would suggest that he thought that it wasn't purely formal. That there was some inevitable constituents of the... Yeah, well, I also think that, uh, for example, this uh, solution and that which says that uh, happiness is not a real end for Aristotle, it's not this, so much a, a good one, and there is much debate on this, because it's true that Aristotle says that uh, happiness must be specified in its constituents, but still uh, uh, Aristotle seems to think that happiness is a real end, so it's not just a formal, uh, a formal end. Uh, but the consequence of this would be really incoherent with other parts of Aristotelian theories. For example, it would, the cons a consequence would be the fact that happiness is just uh, an irrational end. So, not uh, really something that uh, our reasoning is not involved in. And uh, this is a problem, rightly, because uh, Aristotle also thinks that human, what human beings have to do in order to, to do good actions is to accomplish their nature and so using their rationality. And so it is really incoherent to say that the end of all human action is something that we maybe desire, but we don't, uh, but uh, that. Uh, doesn't have does have nothing to do with our rationality. Okay, so thanks very much again. Thank